Professor Forsyth, it's a great privilege to interview you for the Elman Scholars Archive. You've had a varied and illustrious career, which started in the early days of the implementation of the National Party's controversial racial policies in South Africa, where you were an undergraduate at the University of Pittsburgh. It progressed via Cambridge, Canterbury, and Cape Town, until you established yourself at Cambridge once more in the 1980s, where you became a fellow of Robinson College and ultimately the inaugural Sir David Williams Professor of Public Law at Cambridge University. On this very journey, you became, into earlier, a renowned expert on South African constitutional and judicial matters, UK administrative law, and a sought after constitutional consultant for emerging Commonwealth countries. You also have close links with the law faculty at the University of Hong Kong. During this time, you have written numerous books and journal articles, and I'm sure that our readers will listen with great interest to your views and your reminiscences on this wide range of topics and some of the controversies you have encountered. So could we start with your early life? You were born in 1950, two years after the National Party took over the governments of South Africa in 1948. Can I interrupt for a moment? I noticed in the notes that it said I was born in 1950, I was born in After the war, my father stayed in the army and was seconded to the British Army to work in signals and radar. And that's how I came to be living in, in England. My parents came to be living in England in the late 1940s, 1950s. And I was born in England and I was strong South African connections. I wondered about that. So your parents were actually South African? Yes. Yes. Right. And uh, uh, I wouldn't be interested to go into the details of uh, which parts was South African, which parts were not British, or whatever. That was a mixed bag. Interesting. Um, yes. Uh, so, your uh, primary, any, any other background information before you moved to your primary school? No, I don't think so. Um, and bearing in mind, of course, for the readers, that you grew up in the 50s and 60s and um, immediately after the 1948 election. And while you were still at primary school, you do remember the 1958 general election for Inchel, when Blair could see a nationalist candidate won and your mother explained the politics to you. Yes. It was, when I was, I think, about eight years old. Um, we had to get out of the way quickly because, uh, because this group of robber and busters, probably slightly drunk men, were coming down the road. They were celebrating the victory of Barkas here. And I didn't understand why quite what was going on in my mother explained the rough, the, the rough outline of how politics worked. And it seemed to me as soon as she explained it that it was fundamentally unjust that that people shouldn't have votes. And so, from that very early stage, under the tuition of my mother, my essentially liberal political views were established. The other thing that I might mention, if we're talking about my childhood, my, my father left the army now, back in South Africa, working as an electric venture gatherer in a large industry. Um, and this was, of course, in Ferenheim, which is notorious for being the column of the shuffle shooting. And uh, I remember the shuffle shooting very clearly uh, with the uh, shuffle massacre, perhaps we should call it, very, very, very clearly. And the going out of breaking in my, my, my primary school 
You see the plane circling overhead, and it, and it come ready to drop bombs if necessary. And we, we saw the fly, fly around about high school, and then ran out to change my library books and two armored cars standing beside the side of the library. So, and my father again going to work and going to work in rough clothes because he was going to spend the day shoving coal into the boilers rather than let them out because all the workers had gone on strike. Those are my memories of one side of the barricades of the Shelfall Massacre, in particular significance out of the spirits that I relate in this city. My, my, um, I hope my voice isn't too soft to be recorded. No, I wouldn't worry about it. No. We'll, we'll be able to thank you very audible. Yeah, thank you. That's probably a reasonable place to stop with the, with the video, I think. That's a lovely yes, introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll stop there. Most important thing. Yes. It's been wonderful to see you. Yes, I am happy to see you. It won't be so long again before I see you again. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the interview. It's yeah. going to be fascinating. And I'll speak to you in a great time. Right. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. Forsyth, you did secondary schooling at St. Stephen's College under Stained Cricher. This was in St. Johannesburg, and you were influenced by your English teacher, David Brinkley. And uh, I wonder if you could say something about this early mentor. Well, one, I think it's worth mentioning in the context of this interview in particular is that it turns out that David Dysonizer and I had the same, uh, another intermediate in this series, had the same English teaching for David Brindley. Um, the, the difference between our two situations was that he was a little, a year or two after I was taught by, by Mr. Brindley, who's recording. Uh, but apart from that, and then in different schools, uh, I was at St. Stephen's and, and, and Brindley was teaching in Woodley, the school that was founded by Stan Cricker, when he was sacked as head, headmaster of St. Stephen's College for being too liberal. Well, uh, that was the... Was, uh, so I, I, I was in, had my secondary education in, in St. Stephen's College. And in the end, I suppose I was quite successful at it. In that I, I was ducks at the school at the end. Although I certainly didn't start at the top of the class. I sort of somehow managed to get to the top of the class by the time the school, the school for the end. St. Stillian's was a Methodist foundation, but it was 
if not expressly, it was impliedly founded on the ideals of an English public school. We had houses and team spirit and lots of sport and cold showers and so forth and so on as, uh, as, as suitable. Um, but I'm very grateful to Sosibi because it, it confirmed a lot of my understanding of political views as well. Somewhere in the bunch of arts and civilians, it was it's not official motto or anything, but it was talk, talked about creating liberal Christian gentlemen. Of course, they were only gentlemen, they were all male school at that, that, that time, although not today, of course. Um, Christians, it's a nod to the Ephesus Foundation. Uh, and Liberal, it's a liberal Christian gentleman. Uh, I don't know how many of those I can claim to full full full, uh, but two out of three Panthers and two Panthers. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the masters, particularly the ones who came from England, it was quite an usual thing to do to get someone like uh, Brindley who was a very young man. Uh, he just got his Cambridge degree, the board might have been an Oxford degree, I don't know, until I know his academic hood was was furry. It was the sign of a Cambridge degree, Cambridge or Oxford degree at the time. Um, he, every, every year there would be one or two people from, from the United Kingdom come out. I, I have finished the degree in, in the UK and they come and spend two or three years teaching in, in South Africa and some of them stayed and some of them went back and so forth. And Brindley was an absolutely inspiring teacher of English um, and if, if my writing has any clarity and colour in it, it must in part be due to Brindley's teaching great enthusiasm for uh, for vigorous English and the use of colour and metaphor and so forth. And I can remember that um, Macbeth, of course, was one of our Shakespeare plays, and we took Macbeth to pieces uh, in, in English classes. And um, he was very impressive and that had a, uh, a, a great effect on me. And I think um, David Eisenhower would, would say much the same sort of thing about him. So I, it's intriguing that this was, this one man should have been so influential in the lives of two of your interviewees. Indeed. Yes. And uh, David Eisenhower will come up again speak about your um, interest involvement in the Truth and Reconciliation mm. Commission. Uh, your academic success at St. Stithians propelled you to the University of Natal in Peter Maritzburg, and although you, uh, one would think from what you've said, you excelled at English, you were obviously very good at maths because you read maths and you did a BSc in mathematical statistics and maths, as well as two years of economics, for which you received a first-class result in your first year. Um, what made you decide to not to follow maths as a career? That's a very good question. Uh, and I've got to think a bit about it. Yes. Is something that took place over a period of time. My mother, first of all, was, I think she was the only woman in her class reading maths at UCT before the war. And so she was a, a mathematician and she became a formidable teacher of mathematics. Um, and so but in, in one sense it was the family business of mathematics. Um, my father, as an engineer, also had a great deal of especially applied mathematics in his 
Indian background. So it's not surprising perhaps that I was thinking of, thinking of maths. And I realized uh, my fun view of mathematics, but I probably wasn't good enough to be a really good mathematician. And I didn't want to spend my life teaching maths at a secondary school. But I probably would want to be good enough to teach maths at a, at a university. So I was looking for something else to do. And I was becoming more and more politically involved in it. I wanted to do something about it to, 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 to make my career all right. Doing something about combating the injustices that were everywhere in South Africa. Right? And so that's why it seemed to me that law might be in the direction to go. I thought I had naive ideas about using the law to create liberty. And these were, I, I would now think, of relatively naive ideas. But they, they turned me towards, towards law. Um, and I don't think I don't regret that decision. But it, it did mean, it does mean, I think it still does to this day, that my approach to law is always logical and conceptual and founded in fundamental principles that one hopes everybody can agree. You agree about, and then you can move on to see what else is implied by that agreement. So that's how I turned to law. And the law school in Peter Mads, which I naturally shifted into, um, was, I think, one of, the, one of the best law schools in South Africa. It was head, headed by a, another man who was very influential in my life. Professor Exton Birchall, who um, uh, who was part of the furniture of the Peter Madsburg Law School. Of course, in those days, law schools were very small, only about a dozen or a dozen and a half members of staff. And so members of staff had to spread themselves pretty thin, teach a great many subjects. So I was taught by many subjects by Exton Birchall. We used to call him the RM, or reasonable man, because he was always reasonable, thoughtful, receptive, and logical in his, his approach to legal problems. So we were, we as students were much impressed by that. Uh, I accent virtual the, the RM. And in a way, his, his why I came to Cambridge at all, in that. He was a Cambridge man, he'd been a Nelson Bellot scholar at Clare, I think. Might have been Trinity Hall, no, Trinity Hall. Um, so he was a Cambridge man, so when I sort of tentatively approached him, uh, to say I, I was thinking of studying abroad, at least gave me the possibility of studying abroad, he said, well, yes, of course, you'll be going to Cambridge. <laughs> And uh, he stepped this firmly in the direction of Cambridge. And uh, the rest is history. So, while you were, before you came to Cambridge, still at Peter Marisburg, any um, recollections of life on campus and how it perhaps resonated with the political developments unfolding in South Africa at the time? Uh, it, Peter Madsburg was a liberal university, um, and so uh, although the liberal universities were not perfect, not by any manner of means, they were a remarkable survival in the rather horrific circumstances of South Africa. And I think there were some very good and noble and brave people who uh, led liberal universities in South Africa. 
and I, I was a small part of that liberal review in that um, I was politically involved in that I was a member of the old liberal party uh, and would, would want to be an accurate others. I don't think I ever paid a subscription and I was a, an active hanger-on for the old liberal party and attended, which was which was closed down, you may, you may recall, by the, by the government when well, it closed itself down because the government was insisting that it became really racial, that you couldn't be a person of colour and a member of the Liberal Party. Um, and the Liberal Party was founded on the idea of equality, so that's actually an example. So I attended the, uh, the, the meeting to close down. Uh, the Liberal Party. Um, I then dabbled a bit with the Progressive Party and, and joined many other societies. I was a uh, member of the South African Institute of Race Relations and I'm not sure that all these little things are, could be of interest to you. This was during this time when you were doing your, first of all, your, 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 your uh, BSc and then your LLB. Yes. I've been this all at the University of Big Mouth, but yes. I took part, took part in many, many protests. Had my, had my room searched quite frequently uh, by the security police, to be by the security police, but they were informed me to tell him. Um, and uh, you actually tutored in maths while you were doing your law degree. Yes, yes I. So you continued your interest in, in maths. It's, it's, it was very, very useful to be able to, I mean, the, the system there was, as is in places, the, the, the students in second and third year of mathematics if they had the aptitude, could teach the first years, could teach the first years. And roughly could be equivalent to supervising in, uh, in Cambridge terms. And that was very convenient for me because it provided me with an opportunity to earn some money while I was a, while I was a student. And so for uh, BSc years and then my, my law years, I was a well, I was a fixture in the tutoring of maths um, at the maths program. And uh, I enjoyed it. And, and uh, we already began to enjoy teaching because I like to to see people that I understand problems that have been explained explained to them. I thought the cup was clear enough. I think mathematicians call it the aha experience when the penny drops and you understand what is going on. Um, so that's when I I got interested in teaching um, and I was able to pay my bills by earning money as a uh, maths. And then, of course, I had a period only of nine months that comprised an academic year uh, in which I finished my law degree and I wasn't yet going up to Cambridge. I had this gap before I went up to Cambridge. And Exton Virtual said I would could be a temporary assistant and a lecturer at the the University of Peter Maxwell, so I spent an academic, academic year uh, teaching in the law faculty as a very junior lecturer. And perhaps that is when you published two of your earliest pieces, which appeared in 1975, Some Aspects of Robbery and What Happens When Lex Kauzai Changes, both in the South African Law Journal. What drew you to these two topics? early stage of your career? 
will be what happens when the next cars are changes. Is my first article on private international law, and it was to do with a case, if I remember it correctly, where a couple had moved from East Germany to the West and eventually ended up in, in South Africa, accumulated wealth, and been fallen out with each other and that marriage had failed. And the question was whether the, the law of the Soviet Republic or the East Germany governed their own marriage and particularly the the consequences thereof. Um, uh, or whether it was the modern South African law or the one West German law. It's another contender. And the point was crucial was because the law had changed. And in particular, the law of East Germany had changed. I can't even quite remember in what direction it had changed in the interim. And if you, if you decided that East German law was applicable, which was relatively straightforward, how did you decide when it was the East German law at the time of the marriage or the East German law as it had now developed? And just a case concern uh, established from South African law, the principle that the law as it changes applies. You choose a legal system that includes a choice of the legal system's rules in regard to change. So if the legal system would have changed the law in regard to matrimonial property. If the change law would apply to the position of the country in South Africa. Um, and I could see it at that stage that my, I, I got quite interested in this really rather wicked night area. As many, many, many lawyers think of it as just a as private international conflict of laws. As, in a sort of complex marine where people shouting comprehensively at each other rather than a principal system of the world. I thought there was something more to be said about it, and I tried to say it. We are quite about some aspects of robbery that, that arose out of a, one of those a gruesome cases that. Uh, far too common in, in South Africa, where one man had, had stabbed another man to, to death uh, for in a dispute over a packet of cigarettes. And the question was whether it was, I don't know why it wasn't murder, but the question was whether it was robbery. And he, you know, the accused, a man called Tamini. And the accused, while arguing his defense, that he couldn't be guilty of robbery, he might be guilty of theft because he picked up the pack of cigarettes and made off with it. But he couldn't be guilty of robbery because the, the threat with the knife and the stabbing with the knife was not what caused him to submit to the taking of the cigarettes. The cigarettes had already fallen to the ground and were, were there for anybody to pick up whether you stabbed the man or not. And therefore there had been no uh, submission to the taking through the use of violence. It wasn't grand robbery. And that of course is, is a nice technical and formalistic argument that the judge was having none of it, which quite quite rightly, I think. It's a robbery for this chapter. I don't know quite how I got into that because I wasn't teaching the criminal law at the time. But I think again, it's the, it's the logical approach that, that made it sort of interest to me. The way it was written was um, both very informative and also, I may say, your style of writing came through, which had been mentioned by. Professor Ellison Khan, when he did a review of your private international law, he, he mentioned your, and I quote, flashes of quiet, quiet humour and dry wit. And I wondered 
whether this was a style um, that you believe you've been able to maintain over the years in your writing on South Africa I, I and UK so. issues. It's it's fine to, to to judge, but um, it's very kind of Alison Carter and another huge influence in my life. Um, but it's very kind of him to say that I've forgotten that he'd, he'd said that, but I I would um, I'm touched that he thought that and yes it's it is of course the only style I've got. I don't I don't have a not sufficiently talented to to write like Jane Austen one day and Friedrich Forsyth the next day or something like that. Um, I I try to I try to be clear, I try to be logical and I I like to think that I can sometimes point out the why idiosyncrasy that there might be. You, in 1975, you came to Cambridge to study for your LLB uh, and you concentrated on judicial review of administrative action, civil liberties, conflict of laws, and comparative law. And the circumstances of your coming were they? I know that you were advised and um, suggested to you by uh, Professor Virgil. Yes. But uh, is there anything else you can tell us about the your actual how you came to Cambridge? I don't think there's anything remarkable about that. Um, Were you at uh, Convalent Keys? Yes, I was at Convalent Keys. Um, which, again, that was largely due to the influence of a, a, chap, a chap, not a lawyer, who had been uh, a student at Common and Keys, a research student at Common and Keys, who was now lecturing in Latin. And I, I, I asked him for his advice, and he said Common and Keys. Uh, which, you obtained research prizes. 1976, 82, and 83. Yes. Well, no, not, not particularly prestigious research prizes, if I, if, we, if I may say so, because they were just foreign research done by research students. And so they, they're not postdoctoral prizes, they uh, doctoral student, uh, research students. Which obviously uh, something that I thought I'd, uh, I could put my hat in the head for it was successful. Uh, but I don't think they're the most prestigious artists. I've done better, I hope. <laughs> um, so, how did you find life in the UK and Cambridge? compared to South Africa, not just physically and weather-wise, but also politically? Well, taking politically first, um, it was part of the whole, part of the whole reason why I wanted to, to go and study abroad, was to escape from the rather oppressive and cloying and injustice dominating South African ecosystem and to come to a, a kind of polity, to come to a democracy which uh, functioned and was relatively efficient and so forth. So it was positive aspects of the British political system and even British administrative system at that stage that, that attracted UK. Um, and the great difference between university at Edinburgh and, 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 and at Cambridge is, of course, one was playing with the big boys now, if I can put it like that. We were at a, a world renowned university. Right? Peter Maritzburg, much fond as I am of that university. It was a tiny little university of fewer than 1,500 students at uh, 
when I was there, and so there were lots of everybody knew everyone else, very large people. Uh, and we had a very different sense of uh, in, in Cambridge you know, you had very high standards to, to, to achieve and to meet. And it was also in a way taken for granted that you would be able to do that. The, the, the college would have provided the independent underpinning of course to tour the support and supervision and so forth and so on the university of the Catholic authority. It created at its best, I think, a situation where the student and the teacher are on the same side in uh, attempting to get the student through the examination. Whereas in the in a small university like Eton Hadsburg, everyone knew who the example for criminal law was. And students would come around and fish to see whether they could get any hints as to what might be in the examination paper. Uh, and sometimes they would be successful and sometimes they wouldn't be. Sometimes the, the examiner might be potentially found it misleading. Uh, but, well, in, in Cambridge with the examiner being somewhat separate and the theoretic at any rate unknown to the student, there's much less scope for that sort of thing that seems to be. The more important thing was an intimate, intimate relationship between the student and the teacher in which they, they collaborate together to see the student does as well as what well. That's the system when it's working as it's bad as best. Because it doesn't always work as best. The other great change that struck me is that Keyes was a unisex college, of course, in 1975. Um, and this was matters that concerned the fellows very greatly, not the research students very much. But it was definitely a different attitude there. Uh, not that there was gender equality, but there was a mixture of genders, I think, uh, at the University of Queen of So that was quite a, quite a big difference that occurred to me. During this time, you were from 76 to 80 secretary and member of the Active Juridica editorial board. How did this work while you were at Cambridge, given that there was no email in those days? I, I think this may be an ambiguity in my, in my CV. I was secretary and member of the editorial board of Active Juridica, which is a UC, UCT published. Journal, and it um, and it had been allowed under its previous editors to fall behind. And when I was doing this work, which was down there from seventy six to eighty two, I and the other members of the editorial board brought it up to date. We were doing this entirely in Cape Town. This was, this was when I came, came back to Cape Town in the, in the early 1980s uh, to, pick up a, to pick up a journal that was about five or six years out of date. And I was keeping it up with, I think, I was in the mid 76. I'm indeed the, the editor of the 76 volume. It's not that I did the work in 76, I would have done it in 78 or 79, something like that. Um, we were much helped by that, by the fact that Ben Beinart, another sort of luminous, luminous figure in South African legal academia, and he was for quite a while. Barber Professor of Jurisprudence at, at Birmingham, the same chair that David Feldman held, I think, before uh, he came to Cambridge. Um, and Ben, ben Bynot had, had a half organised vestrift 
uh, according to Whitten. Uh, various articles in praise of being by God. And the response to the invitation to help with the success group went out so widely, and then the rough material came back to, to make a volume for the script. And then made a volume for the script to produce. And that's what, what we produced, and that's how we, how we caught up the, the missing years. So there's a mammoth festival for being made of which, 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 which was published, uh, uh, published as a, uh, both separately as the festival and yearly as a active yearly curve volume. That's all one that the guy that makes made sense. Oh, that is great. Thank you. And very interesting about uh, Ben Bylord. Yes. Because of course his uh, reputation is legendary. Professor um, Forsyth, could we come now to some of the mentors or the uh, academics that you would have encountered during this, your first um, sojourn at Cambridge? And to this end, I've actually given you a list. I wonder whether you might run through any memories of the first of all the professors and then some of the lecturers. Well, um, talking about the professors, the one that stands out above all others in my my mind is Kurt Lipstein. I attended his classes on comparative law and also conflict of law. I was very impressed by him, and he stimulated my thought about conflict of law so is as a, as a comparative subject that we should try and build conflict of law systems that are fitting with each other by profound comparative study of the relevant choice of law. Um, and he was a great enthusiast for the comparative method, and he infected me with it. Uh, so yes, he's a, um, he is certainly a, a person that I would, I would mention above all others, above all others. And um, there was something else I wanted to mention about Cambridge. Oh yes, uh, afterwards, many years afterwards, when the, the book Juris Dabbutic was published, even the account of the various people who came to this country, fled from Germany in the 1930s and so forth. Uh, when that book was published, I was very pleased to be able to write the assessment of Kurt's work. And I did. He was the only subject for whom there were two entries. Yes. Um, yes, the editors would ask me to write a second one uh, from a wrong broader perspective. Uh, but anyway, he was very influential in, in my development. And not on this list, I suppose he might be on the professor's list, I was not on the professor's list either. Um, um, is Sir so Otto Kahn Freud, who was in 1975 the Goodhart Professor, and he also taught on the, on the Conflict of Laws course and on the Comparative Law course. And very often both Kahn Freud and Kurt Lipstein would come to the seminars together and they would present joint seminars. Um, and that was, that was really stimulating and, 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 and exciting at times. I mean, they often had quite different things at other times they just coincide. But the most important thing is that they were both enthusiasts. Of the, of the other those are, those are the Cambridge 
the physics that you mentioned, uh, some of which became uh, not yet a professor, of course, you ought to be on this list. Was Mr. David Williams in those days? Was he? He also taught the judicial review course and, uh, and introduced me to Will Wade was still in Oxford, and David Williams was perhaps the leading administrative lawyer in Cambridge at the time. They all were, of course, yes. I think. I think Stanley the Smith had died, so he probably might have been the leader of this before he was still alive. But David Williams was the leader of this before, I thought so. And he's the busiest man in the university, he was the senior tutor of, of Emmanuel and a big serving on the Council of the Senate and various other important bodies. And, uh, and also teaching on, on comparative, or on judicial review, and he even made an immense impression on me, because again, he was always on the side of the student, trying to help the student rather than make things heavy, difficult for the student. Um, and he invited me and uh, another colleague to come back to his rooms in, in Emmanuel on one occasion to discuss various points of difficulty we'd had in uh, studying the course. And it was incredible that the man, who was literally the busiest man in the university, was prepared to give seemingly an unlimited hours to uh, his very junior students. So I'd mentioned David Williams as well as David Williams. Um, Tony Jolovich too, who will be very great to me. But I'm afraid I don't, I look at you as it wasn't taught by uh, Gandhi Williams or Bobby Jennings. Terry Wilson. Anyway. I don't give the names of the people I might mention. Um, as far as the lecturers were concerned, Nikki Tahas says, oh, oh yes, so David Williams is here, and I apologize to you if you didn't miss the lecturers. He wasn't a professor yet. Um, Nikki Tahas is, is mentioned, of course. I uh, was, was very, very pleased to, to know the guitars. And he was a proctor as well, so I passed across in that way and spent many hours together at the Senate House, pontificating in that and all the students to get their degrees. Um, but I'm, I'm destroying your chronology a bit because this happened when I was in Cape Town. Um, Nikki Das had a sinecure, or had, had, had an interesting appointment, shall I say, but I don't want to suggest it was majority of anything there, in that he was an external examiner of the University of Zimbabwe. And every, every Christmas time, he fly out to Zimbabwe and box, take the papers and so forth and so on. And on one of those was at sea. He came out to Cape Town and we came to visit the law family in Cape Town. And we got there, I got there quite well then. We we got various jobs around Cape Town and, and so forth. So I, I felt it was really quite uh, a, 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 a very cautious, very measured, very precise man. 
and very gentle. They are very fond of pretty cars. Um, I think he was perhaps he had some experiences in Cape Town that were very good. And this was of course in the, in the days of apartheid. So perhaps he had some good experiences with us. We were supposed to be up the mountain together, but um, the wind was blowing and we couldn't get up the mountain on the cable car. And we, at some stage in the center, we've got to talk about the, the world of the, the mountain in my jurisprudence. Um, that we couldn't go out the mountain because the wind was bad. So we wandered through the garden and had a lovely day. Um, it wasn't that we couldn't go out the mountain because the uh, Mickey had uh, we told we wanted to go out the mountain. It turned up in a suit with little polished brown shoes on it. <laughs> so we cancelled that. Um, we we interrupted it. Speaking of Mickey Mickey Dallas, he's a lovely man. Just, and we've obviously we tell these famous stories about what it was like being a tail gunner in the RAF during the war. I've enjoyed his time. Yes. Well, it's very positive. In the large part, of course, was the lawyer on the committee that appointed me to be my teaching fellowship at Robinson College. He was the only lawyer on the, on, on the committee. So, if I did anything wrong, he was responsible. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, for college appointment, it was mostly college fellows and one lawyer from outside. See fit back. And uh, there was no lawyer in Robinson at that stage. That was the only And then C. Lee. And I'm looking for it. And Michael Pritchard. Then C. Lee, particularly. I mean, they were my introduction to, uh, to Cambridge. And they really were exceptionally interested and diligent in looking after their students. And I'm sorry I haven't seen Ben Seeley for, for ages, but he moved away from Cambridge and I died. Ken Pilot I only knew slightly. But he's another one of the South African mafia who wanted to put it that way. John Spencer, afterwards on the lecture list, but he's the was a professor afterwards that then a supremely wicked man and a big supplier. Never taught me. He became a sort of humanic comic. Peace. Thank you very much. Um, would, are you okay to continue for another, say, ten minutes or so? Yes, yes, fine. Thank you. Uh, that brings us then to 1977, when you took a lecturing post at Canterbury. After your LLB Cambridge. And I wondered how this came about. Well, I, it was part of a, a scheme to escape from South Africa. I mean, I could clearly have gone back to South Africa and you know, imagine I've got a, a teaching job if that's what I wanted uh, at the, uh, one of the liberal South African universities. And Alternatively, I could have gone into practice to the South African bar if I still thought that I was increasingly not again thinking this way. If I still thought the tool could be used as a, uh, as a way to achieve justice, 
Uh, so, but I, I thought that I thought I had, a, I had one idea of New Zealand, and I I thought it would be like Britain, but in the South Pacific, it would be warm and warm and gentle, and a bit exotic. Now it turned out in Christchurch, it was pretty cold and snow on the ground, and. Also, to, to be frank about it, everybody, I, I, I like my students very much in, in New Zealand and made some good friends. They're still friends on the staff of the University of Canterbury. Um, but New Zealand turned out to be a pretty long way away from anywhere wanted to set to the Now, there are very good lawyers who come from New Zealand. The numerous one thing in Cambridge and so forth is not criticism. It's just that New Zealand's not on the way to anywhere. It's, you get there and the world stops in a way. Um, so I, I just felt very isolated in New Zealand. It was also the case that I was, I was single and it might, might have been different if, if I'd been married and had a family life and so forth. So I decided to, to escape from New Zealand and I made what might have been thought to be a mistake. Lots of things turned out to be a mistake. The opportunity arose. I was approached by Cape Town and said, would I come back and can run this human rights conference? So I came back from New Zealand to a senior leadership in Cape Town. Um, and the brief to run the Human Rights Conference, which was about a, just over a year from the conference, and it had to be made, made to work, and it was a, a huge endeavour. I think I'm quite proud about it. And the first of its kind? It was, the, yes, it was the, the first of its kind in South Africa. Yes. It also, which is quite a remarkable thing in South Africa at that time, everyone who wanted to come to it was allowed to come to it. We fought a, quite a battle with the South African government because um, they refused to say people who required visas, which many of the participants would. They, they, People who required visas wanted to get pre clearance, wanted the South African government to say, Yes, we'll give you a visa. And the South African government refused to commit itself in advance. These were very leading, leading people from the worlds of academia, the judiciary, the USA, Europe, the UK. And so in the end, we took the decision to apply for for the visas and force the, for force the government to, to turn down the new visas if that's what they wanted to do and they could deal with the problem it would be clearly their fault. Um, rather than cancel the conference ourselves. And we did that and it worked. The government couldn't face it and turn it down. What were in fact just distinguished professors and, and scholars and so forth, not not exactly the revolutionaries. And so we did it. The Queen Alphonse then granted the visas, they all came through, and so they considered everyone who wanted to come with them to come. Um, which, which, was, which was very good. And it also revealed. In a, in a less flattering light, some of the some of the scholars who, or I'm thinking of one, and I'm not going to mention his name, who refused to turn up because he thought it was too much of, a, of an imposition to, to for him to get a visa. He should just be granted a visa automatically and waived through. 
And this was really just an excuse to, to start a South African boycott of a South African enterprise. Uh, anyway, uh, that all happened. Uh, and its the proceedings were published uh, in a single volume of Act of the Red Care Again. Thought it was a catch up. I think that was 1979 or 1980. Um, and it, uh, it was a great achievement because well, I think we've been persuaded. Michael Corbett, after the Sub Chief Justice, uh, to come and give an opening address at the conference, which had 350 or so people, I think, and they gave the opening address at the conference, in which he explicitly called for a judicial enforceable Bill of Rights in South Africa, which again, at the height of apartheid, was. It doesn't solve any of anybody's problems, but it's, it's quite, quite an achievement. So we did that. Um, I don't know if you had any, this might be a really useful place to deal with any other questions you might have had about the Human Rights Conference. Um, I think I'm just keen to know the background which you've outlined very, very uh, yeah. succinctly. Thank you. Um, the money for it all came from. American foundations, the Ford Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, right. provided the flights to fly. Yes. The visiting speakers, people from, from the United States, Europe, and the UK. Right. Well, something else that was very interesting, it seems to me, about your visit period of your life was that you actually visited the Hague. You know, Academy for International yes. Scholarship Study. Yes. Peace Palace. Yes. And um, I wonder if you could tell us something about that. Well, that was that, that is just my interest in, in private international law. Because, uh, it was the year or so after the Human Rights Conference. Yes. And I, uh, I, I sought, in some ways, almost as a it was a break from human rights and public law and back to private international mind. I interest in that. And the, the course of the Hague still runs in the same way. It's divided into two public international and private international. And I attended the private international courts, courts and uh, made a contribution to the to the discussions and went to lots of interesting talks in the Hague. Spent, I spent three weeks or a month in the Hague altogether. Uh, Which must have fit into your book, Private International Law. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it was after, after I'd been to the Hague that I came back and uh, conceived of the idea of writing the next book on Private and uh, lots of the ideas that I developed there and gave, gave currency, certainly in Southern Africa, but perhaps in other parts of the world too, um, of multilateral choice of law rules being used to leave a uniformity of decision out of the mass of uh, otherwise incoherent just in the subject. Um, that all comes from essentially the European influence on me through the Hague Academy. Right. That is very interesting indeed. Um, during this time, you published six journal articles, mostly in the South African Law Journal, and I wondered if you could sum up for us what your main research topics were during this period. I think I always did some writing on uh, conflict of laws. 
I've written a few things on, on constitutional law. But I think why the articles for which I would be known in this period are my jurisprudential articles. Another <coughs> one, one is called Human Rights and Ideology. And it seeks, out, seeks to counter a view that was quite common in left wing political circles in South Africa, which was to the effect that there should be this very little point in having a judicially enforceable rule of rights in, in South Africa, because this would prevent the, the incoming democratic government from readjusting the property, from, from, from redistributing the property in accordance with the Marxist vision of quality of outcome. And so there, there was, I think, quite a, a strong and a dangerous movement in left wing South African politics to, to get away from classic liberal ideas such as the good of law, judicially enforceable human rights and things like that. And essentially what I did in that article, Human Rights and Ideology, was to take the views of Popper, who I had started to read in Cambridge. four or five years after my initial exposure to Popper, to, to take essentially Popper's critique of Marxism and focus it in, into a South African context. And unsurprisingly, um, lead to the conclusion that, that we should have a democratic polity use the judiciary to enforce human rights and so forth and so on. Which because I, th I think given that I'm not, not, not saying my life but I have this effect but it was on the side of history when, when it made this critique because these days nobody suggests that the judiciary enforce human rights are, are worthless or this prevents or of a political reform. So yes. it was a defense of classic liberalism yes. and, and made quite a fuss at the time. Uh, I think made me unpopular in some fields. But, but I think it's, it's not like I'm quite pleased about an ideology. The other, the other article that I wrote about the stuff which, which ties in with what David Eisenhower is, is writing about um, is on the judicial process positivism and civility. John Dugard had become in South Africa the proponent of the view that the judges had a judicial discretion to make the law. And therefore, it was reasonable to call upon the judges to remake South African law in a way that excised from it the obvious injustices of racial discrimination and inequality of all sorts. And this requires that, of course, the South African judges at that time parroted what I called vulgar or stimulus. An idea that law was the command of the superior, medical superior, and that was that. Um, and this, this positivist view said you God should be rejected, and instead we should adopt one or other of the natural and serious approaches so that you could, the judges could intervene and say, no, this is an outrageous law. It's 
discriminatory or whatever it is. You have to strike it down as a, as a piece of law. And that was a view that <coughs> I and a friend of mine, Hyam Schiller, increasingly came to, to question. Hyam Schiller was a colleague at UCT. And he left UCT at about the same time that I did and went in for a commercial career uh, as an in house company lawyer in Europe. Uh, chiefly because he was needed to escape from South Africa, like, as we all were at that stage. Uh, And he didn't think that he'd be able to get an academic career. So I don't think I'd be really going to those things. Um, he, was, he was an Austrian who came to, to Cape Town to teach there for a couple of years and intended to go back. And he liked it and he stayed for a few years longer and then if he wanted to go back, he went back and had a successful commercial career as an in house counsel. In Europe, um, but he was a friend. He was a friend of mine. So he's a friend of mine. He was visiting just a weekend or two ago, um, and he really introduced me to the kind of positivism that is in the uh, in the held up and to be adopted by Kelsen. Johan was an Austrian, Johnson was an Austrian, that was quite a jelly in there. And Johan and I would climb the Tangle Mountain together, generally once a week, sometimes as frequently as three times a week, we'd go up the mountain and we'd have huge potential discussions up the mountain. And And it was really quite wonderful that we, we stimulated each other and agreed on all the basics and we worked out everything else logically with each other. And he he was friendly with me with positivism. It was not a theory of the law. Didn't tell you what the law was. As people who said that it's not law if it's discriminatory, tell you what the law was. Tell you how you found out what the law was. That was through the use of reason and logic of the sources of law. And this is what led to our criticism of John Dugard. That heartache is a legal phenomenon enforced by, <coughs> by an army of civil servants and judges and, and policemen or whatever. And it's a legal ranking that it's done according to rules to a greater or lesser extent. How do you account for this phenomenon? And the phenomenon it's there, it's real. You could, you could see it in South Africa every day of the week. What account do you give of it, that phenomenon? Well, you have to have a theory of knowledge. And your theory of knowledge, we said, was that you found out what the law was by looking at the sources of law and applying me to the project. If, as in South Africa's case, that meant that you had to attribute the status of law to the enactments of a deeply undemocratic sovereign parliament. You had to face up to that reality, realize that that's what one was working with, uh, rather than have just wishful thinking or might even be thought of as political posturing 
is like the, the calculus to get to escape it and say this particular law is, is, is kind of no longer going to have an effect. Uh, just wasn't going to happen. We thought that the problem had suggested it might. And that caused a bit of a stir. As people on the left to have not been put off by my human rights and ideology article. Now I thought we were upholding it as a current order by because I've been drunk you got. We've been famous to say drunk you got and I suggested that. And I think that that was a I think that that article article called Judicial process, positivism, and civilities. Um, I think that, but that was another one that I'd be quite proud of. Um, in the South Africa, or Jim Moore. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I think that uh, your next stage of your career is Cambridge again. And I think we should leave that for our next interview. And um, for now, we should close with my thanking you most sincerely for a truly fascinating account, which I'm extremely grateful for. You've been very patient. It's been extremely interesting. And I know it's going to be of great value for the archive. Thank you very much indeed.